Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fries from Central New Mexico Community College. In video H, we're going to take a look at the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a bilobed gland, two lobes interconnected by something called the isthmus. It's a very, very vascularized gland such that uh, surgery on the thyroid gland, from what I hear, is quite bloody. And it sits nearby the thyroid cartilage. It doesn't usually quite cover the thyroid cartilage, so it sits more inferior to it. We can't forget that our thyroid gland does not just produce thyroid hormones. There's two kinds, as we'll see. But it also produces calcitonin, which you already studied in Anatomy and Physiology 1. Let's take a look at the histology of a thyroid gland. The histology is very characteristic, and I, I've left it here in the background, but I think we can see it good enough. What's so characteristic about the thyroid's histology is that you see all of these pinkish circles, and these are what we call follicles, and they're delineated by these somewhat cuboidal cells, which we call the follicle cells. And the pinkish stuff on the inside we call the colloid. So the pinkish interior of the follicles we call the colloid. And the cuboidal cells that form the follicles we call the follicular cells. This is where um, the thyroid hormones are produced. Now in between the follicles, maybe here, are what we call parafollicular cells, and they're going to be producing the other hormone called calcitonin. There are two forms of thyroid hormone called T3 and T4, and the 3 and the 4 reflect how many iodine atoms are present in the hormone, either 3 or 4. And notice that T4 can actually be converted to T3 by the removal of one of the iodine groups. T4 you often hear also being referred to as thyroxine. You already know by now that thyroid hormone is regulated by thyroid stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary which in turn is controlled by the thyroid releasing hormone from the uh, hypothalamus. When thyroid hormones begin to rise in levels, they're going to actually feed back negatively to our hypothalamus and even the pituitary. What's interesting about thyroid hormone is that it can be stored. This is a very unique feature and maybe I should circle this in red. So thyroid hormone can actually be stored, as we'll take a look at. Thyroid hormone and growth hormone are two hormones that play a very important role in many parts of the body. Just like growth hormone impacted tissue growth, we see that thyroid hormone does as well. But what's more important is that, or even more important I should say, is that without thyroid hormone, we can't see proper development of especially our, our nervous or skeletal system, but also our nervous system. Even our reproductive capabilities are influenced by thyroid hormones. I think many of you know by now that thyroid hormones very much influence our metabolic rate. And they do that by stimulating enzymes of glycolysis and therefore um, allow for um, more ATP to be formed, um, more oxygen to be consumed, and it results in more production of heat. People who are low in thyroid are often cold, for instance, because they cannot generate enough heat. Thyroid hormones are also going to increase adrenergic receptors. Remember, these are receptors that bind noradrenaline or also called norepinephrine. And that means that thyroid hormone can indirectly control blood pressure regulation um, by affecting the number of 
adrenergic receptors. So here we see a review of how thyroid hormone is regulated or HAR regulated if you want to think of T3 and T4. If their levels are low in the blood, the hypothalamus is going to release thyroid st releasing hormone, which in in then in turn stimulates the release of TSH from, TSH from the anterior pituitary, which directly stimulates the thyroid uh, gland to release um, thyroid hormone, um, which is formed by these follicular cells. When thyroid levels begin to increase, then we're going to see that they can feed back and consequently actually stop further release of um, thyroid releasing hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, and thyroid hormone itself. And remember that thyroid hormones are going to impact the metabolic rate of cells to where it's going to, they're going to affect our body temperature by going through um, cellular respiration, especially glycolysis. Let's now take a look at how these two thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, are synthesized. Not that I need for you to know this image in great detail, but it, it's going to illustrate to you how rather complex this is. It's also a reminder for you that thyroid hormones can be stored and that we need iodide for um, the formation of these thyroid hormones. So let's take a look at the upper left-hand corner where we see one thyroid follicle with its cuboidal cells. Remember this pinkish material on the inside of the follicle we call the colloid. And next, in close proximity to the follicular cells, we have a capillary. So if we blow this up, we have here in the pinkish, the colloid. Here we have the inside of our cell with the nucleus. And then here we have our capillary with its endothelium. So when thyroid stimulating hormone binds to the receptors on the follicular cells, probably by a secondary mes messenger mechanism, ultimately we're going to see that protein synthesis occurs and we form a protein called thyroglobulin inside here, inside of this vesicle here. So the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, pack it all up inside of this vas vesicle. And this vesicle that contains the thyroglobulin will then go through the process of exocytosis to where the thyroglobulin is now literally dumped into the colloid. Once in the colloid, our thyroglobulin is going to combine with iodide that was brought in from the blood. That's why we ingest um, iodine. So via the blood, it's pumped into the cell and then it makes it out of the cell into the colloid where um, the iodide will, will then combine with our thyroglobulin such that we now get this rather complex molecule with all of these iodines attached. This molecule will now get back into the cell by means of endocytosis and there it gets split to where we finally end up with thyroxine or T4 and T3, thyroidothyronine. These two molecules, T3 and T4, can then make it back into the blood and get distributed to the cells that need it to go through um, their changes in their metabolic rate. Again, let's not forget that the thyroid also produces a calcium regulating hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin works opposite parathyroid hormone, which we'll take a closer look, la look at in just a moment uh, in, when we get to the parathyroid glands. Calcitonin is going to inhibit osteoclasts and stimulate to some extent the osteoblast. So it's going to promote the deposit of osteoid or the deposit of new bone tissue. It's going to literally allow for calcium to be taken out of the blood. So we have an increase in calcium uptake from the blood to make more bone tissue. 
We don't see this to be a very essential hormone for survival, certainly not in uh, adults. But we do see that it's sometimes prescribed to menopausal women in the hopes for them to um, slow down the process of osteoporosis.